Amen. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. We're going to have some feedback later on, so you guys are getting used to I'm getting you into practice, okay? So we're going to have some great fun today, diving into God's Word. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that Pastor Brian gives me to fill in in his absence. Uh, he is in Kenya right now, and uh, I'm sure he's probably preached a couple times, maybe, uh, or will be preaching soon. I know he had the, like 12 speaking engagements the uh, whole trip that he was doing, and then it's going to be awesome next Sunday when we celebrate together with him in Kenya and our part, our friends and uh, our family members, basically, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Kenya are going to be with us and worshiping through the screen. So it's going to be a unique experience. So I'd hope you don't miss it. It's going to be great. And uh, so anyway, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, usually, you know how when you get ready to do something for God or something that you feel like is a big deal that God's called you to do, uh, Satan always tries to get in the way. You guys have that ever happened to you? Yeah? So, you know, I'll just be honest. I'm going to be transparent. Um, yesterday, that was happening. Yesterday, Satan was all around me. I had a terrible attitude yesterday. Now, don't look at me like that. Some of you just looked at me like you've never had an attitude before. So, yeah, I had a bad attitude, and I couldn't figure out why. I just had a bad attitude, and Satan was, you know, kind of digging at me a little bit. And, uh, and then it continued through last night, and the devil tried to attack my Tar Heels, and that didn't happen. <laughs> and love overcame. So you, if you know, you know. So anyway, that's a little joke for Pastor Brian because he's a Duke Blue Devil fan, and I had to put a dig on him while he wasn't here. But uh, also... It is true, reality. I did have a bad attitude yesterday. So, you know, and even this morning, it's been fun to watch how Satan's trying to dig into things. We had stuff happen in the soundboard this morning and all kinds of great things. But it doesn't matter because God's word is faithful. Amen? And so today we're going to be in God's word. And I remember last Sunday, you know, I've been, I knew I was going to speak this Sunday. I was praying, God, what would you have me speak on? I want to speak what you want me to speak. And I was praying through a couple passages. And last week, when I was sitting right there next to Kaylee, uh, Kaylee wasn't sitting there, but that's where I was sitting. Uh, but, and I, God spoke to me very clearly as I was listening to Pastor Brian preach John 4. We were in John 4 last week, and he preached a great message about the woman at a well, also one of my favorite passages is the well. And uh, as he's preaching, God spoke to me, and I knew exactly what I was supposed to preach today. So we're going to pick up in John 4, where Brian left off last week. So we'll be in John chapter 4, 4 verse um, 28. And then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 5. And then we're going to go to uh, 2 Timothy 2. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit different than normally when we dive into a passage. We kind of stay in that passage. But today we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. So if you will, turn your Bibles to uh, John chapter 4, verse 28. And I'll read that and then we'll pray. As you notice, many of your guests of ours, they stood for the honoring of the Word of God. So we'll read that. And um, let's see, verse 28 says this. So the woman left her water jar and went into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Let's pray. Holy Father, you're so good and so merciful. We just sang about your goodness. And Lord, I pray that we understand what that really means. And today, as we dive into your word, I pray that that will be more evident, more clear, how you've called us and given us a purpose and given us a name. You've made us for more, Lord God. I pray that we will understand that today. Lord, I pray for Pastor Brian as he is in Kenya, as he'll be speaking this week and, and uh, just ministering while he's there. I pray for his protection and safety, and I pray for the boldness of Christ on him as he's there. Thank you for our time together today. Help us listen with ears that will change us forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so in John chapter 4, the title of my sermon is Made for More. If we pick up the story with the woman at the well, we see that Brian last week challenged us. He's like, we have, as believers in Christ, we have received the living water. And Brian's challenge to, to us was, do not hold the water to yourself. Take the water. 
Tell others about the living water that can change one's eternity. And so that was the challenge we were left with last week. And we picked that up this week because something amazing happens to this woman. She goes back to her village. Now listen, you guys know the story. You remember it from last week. She wasn't a woman of much reputation in the town. In fact, she probably didn't have a lot of friends in that city. She probably wasn't welcomed very much into many places. And so, but she, of all people, had an excuse like, I'm not going to go tell them what I have found because they don't like me and they don't deserve it. That could have been her excuse, but it wasn't because God changed her. And so she goes back to her town and goes back to the village and she tells them this very uh, profound truth that they haven't heard before. And she says to them, look, let me tell you about the guy. Look at verse 28 again. It says, the woman, she left everything there. She had her water jars and everything she had brought with her. She just left it. She didn't care because this was so important and life-changing and impactful for her. So she leaves and goes straight to the town, and this is what she says to them. She says, come. She's inviting them in. Come see the man who told me all about my past the sin that was in my life, the sin that I had been doing, all the things, all the little secrets that many people don't even know, come find out this man who told me all of that about me. Now, she didn't come to the town and say, hey, you guys better turn or burn. That wasn't her message. Her message was just like how Jesus approached her. It was a curiosity of a message. She's like, hey, come see this man. And then she says something very interesting. She poses a question. I think it's, a, it's definitely a rhetorical question, but she's posing the question to create someone's curiosity to go and investigate who Jesus really was. She asked the question, can this be the Christ? Can this be the Messiah, the one we've been waiting on? Can this be? And so what do the people do? They want to see. They want to experience this for themselves. So then they go and they experience the truth of Jesus. Now the woman of the well story I love so much because all of us can relate to her. We all have a past. We all have stuff in our life, right? But we have been saved by grace, but we don't, we can't hold that grace to ourselves. Now look at verse 30. This is, goes on, the story continues in verse 39, excuse me, verse 39. Because of her willingness to go and spread the living water to her town, to her village, to her friends, to her family, to her neighbors, this is what happens. This is the result in verse 39. She says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Many people Many people in her town became followers of Jesus, became new, became life, their life had changed because of her testimony. She just didn't walk in the town and start acting like a good moral person, did she? The scripture doesn't tell us that. She walks in the town and she proclaims the love of God with her testimony. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful story. And she realizes that I cannot keep this to myself because she realized in that moment that she was made for more. That she had to get, she had to tell people this life changing, eternal changing truth and couldn't keep it to herself. Now, Paul picks this story up in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 17. We're going to go there in just a minute. And Paul picks up this story. Now, not necessarily the story of her, but Paul continues to teach the Corinth, church at Corinth that they are redeemed by God. And they are different. Just like the woman at the well, they are made different. Let's look at, see what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, many of you probably have memorized this scripture at some point in your life. And sometimes when we do that, we get very familiar with things. But I want you to hear this as if you've heard it for the first time. So Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If you become new, 
because of Christ. Can I get an amen? If you become new because of Christ, can I get an amen? amen. All right, now you're awake. All right? That is amazing. This is the story of the woman in the well continued, and Paul is telling the church that we have been made new because of who? Because of all the stuff we've done good, right? No. Because of who? Christ. Everybody want to say Christ. Because of Christ, we have been made new and given a new life. And that old sinful chains and bondage that hold, held us down before is broken and it's gone and it's buried with God and buried with Christ, never to be dug up again. That's an amazing concept that we have been made new because of Jesus. But in this newness, we've been made new, but there's another thing that happens here. Look at verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. So not only are you made new in Christ through your trust and belief in Jesus as being the only Son of God, the true salvation. You see that in verse 18. He reiterates that, that this is from God, not because of you, right? And we are being reconciled because of Christ. That's a passive verb, meaning there's nothing that we're doing to earn or gain salvation. But we are responding to the gift of salvation. And then God does something. Not only does it take away our old self, but he gives you a purpose. He gives us a purpose and a ministry. A ministry. And what is that ministry? Everybody say the big word, Reconciliation. You guys are so good. Good job. <laughs> Reconciliation. That's a big, big purpose. God invites us to be a part of his plan, a part of his redemption of the world through the ministry of reconciliation. So not only just make us new and forgive us of our sin, but he invites us into going and being a part of his ministry to the world. Look at verse 19. This continues. And it says this. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting, us the, entrusting to us the message of re reconciliation. So again, I want you to see this. See how beautiful this is. God has redeemed us to himself. Through rec we has reconciled us. What that means, think about this. You and I were objects of God's wrath because of our sin. But we went from being objects of God's wrath to objects of his peace. We went from being objects of God's wrath and having to pay the penalty of sin on our own, but through the reconciliation, we now are given life through Jesus. We are now made a part of his family. We are now redeemed. And it says that the sins that we are guilty of are what? They're put away. They're no longer charged against us. Now guess what? I don't know about you, but that gives me chill bumps to know that I am now reconciled with a holy God. Being unholy myself, I'm now reconciled with him because of Christ. God sees me through the lens of Jesus' blood. But here's the great, even, it gets even better. That that ministry now becomes part of what we do. We have this message, we have a ministry to others in our lives to tell them this amazing truth of God. It's not for us just to hold on to and think it's nice and pretty and be happy about it and think, oh, I'm so glad I'm blessed. No, this is a ministry that God has given us, a message that God has given us to give to the world. That we can't keep this to ourselves. In fact, not only does he give us a ministry and a message, he gives us a title and position. Look at, look at uh, chapter 20, I mean, verse 20. Look at verse 20. 
Therefore, because of that reconciliation, that's what that means, because of Christ's reconciliation, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, of Christ, he recognized, I got a little tongue-tied there, sorry. A little dyslexic and a little tongue-tied, hold on. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. All right? So we not only have a ministry, we not only have a message, but we have a position. Everybody say ambassador. Okay. Ambassador. We are ambassadors of Christ. Now, this word is, is, a, is a high calling. This is a high position. This is a high responsibility. Paul uses this word intentionally because ambassadors in that day and even today represent something way beyond themselves. Now, I've kind of, when I was studying this text, I, I learned something a little new that I hadn't really fully understood. You know, I've always, when I've taught this in the past, I've used the, the illustration like, as we see ambassadors today, like, you know, we have ambassadors that go live in foreign countries and, and work in behalf of the U.S. and other foreign lands, right? And that's a big deal, and that's a big title, and that's something special. But the way I was studying this and, and read this a little differently was back in these ancient times, it wasn't necessarily that the ambassadors from the other countries represented their country, it's basically the ambassadors would come at the time it was Rome. The empire of Rome was ruling at this time. And they would come to Caesar to beg for his mercy, to beg for his approval, to beg for his grace, and, and tell them how they would serve him. They would represent their kingdoms and tell them, the emperor, how we, they would support him. So they would come to Rome. Well, as God always does, right? He always flips the culture. So instead of ambassadors, people going to God, pleading to God for their people or that group or that nation, God is using us, his followers, his, his, his children, to be his ambassadors to go to the lost world. So a lost person doesn't chase after God. God chases after them. Through his son, through us as believers, we're helping that ministry of reconciliation as God is pursuing them with his gospel. Are you guys tracking with me? This is awesome. This is great news that we have been given such an amazing position and such a such an important, important ministry. And I want you guys to see this, that you are made for more than just being saved and coming to church and coming to Bible studies. You are made to go implore. That word is there in verse 20. He says, we are his ambassadors that we would implore on behalf of Christ. That word implore can, in, insinuates that we are, are begging the lost world, please come know Jesus Please know that Jesus loves you and has a desire for you to be healed and completely reconciled to him, completely changed from the sinful nature that's in you to a saved family of God. That's what he's begging them. That's what we're to do. That word implore, that we're to have that ministry to go after him. Go after the world. You know, what else do ambassadors do? Let me kind of give you a snapshot of what ambassadors do. Ambassadors want their lives to outlive themselves. As ambassadors of Christ, we want our lives to outlive ourselves. But as ambassadors, we can't be, tour, we can't be travel agents. Let me explain. A travel agent tells you where to go and how to get there, right? So as a travel agent, if all we were as travel agents, we would be telling people how to go someplace we've never been or ever seen. As a travel agent, hey, I might tell you, hey, to get to heaven, you, you got, heaven's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. I've never been there. 
but I hear it's nice. Right? That's what a travel agent does. It points to something or it tells you about a place that's amazing. What does a tour guide do? A tour guide leads you through something, leads you to understand. See, a travel agent has never known heaven. If they have, if we, if we were travel agents who have known heaven, we wouldn't be sitting here, right? But a tour guide knows God. Why? Because we've been reconciled with Christ. So we know God. We have a relationship with God. So as a tour guide, an ambassador leads them to understand who Christ is and who he wants to be in their life and how God wants to know them. You see the difference? Like a, a travel agent might say, hey, come to this church. They, tell the Bi- they talk about the Bible. Tour guide comes, come with me. Like the woman at the well, come, let me show you someone who's changed my eternity forever. That's who we need to be. That's who God's called us to be. That's the ministry that we have. It's amazing that God has chosen us as his family to do that and to have that opportunity to be a part of such amazing, important ministry, something so grand and, and, and just impactful. But so many times as believers, we just hold on to that salvation or that ministry, that we just want to keep it for ourselves. We're scared about what somebody might talk about us, what somebody might say. I'm very practical. I'm very visual. So I'm going to try something, and don't laugh when you see it if it messes up, okay? So here we go. This is called an Oikos map. You're already laughing. I see some of you laughing right now. You're like, that is the worst handwriting I have ever seen in my life. If your kids want lessons on how to do uh, some handwriting, come see me afterwards. I'll set that up. Um, But this is called an Oikos map. So get very practical about how to be an ambassador. Okay? Oikos is a Greek word that means household or or family or relations. Okay? And so we all have a household. Or it could mean your sphere of influence people that are around you, people that God has connected you with or that your life intersects with. See, I I believe God is sovereign and that our lives intersect with people intentionally. And so this map is a little bit of a way for us to kind of see, okay, Trent, you're telling me to be an ambassador. I hear you. I understand that. But what does that look like? What does that really mean? Well, in your oikos or your household or your sphere of influence, there are people, places, and passions people, your family, people that, maybe your neighbors, okay, places, I, I, play, I work, I have coworkers, you know, maybe uh, I, I, I volunteer at my school, my kid's school, wherever it might be, right? So, you know, that, that, that is where we live, places we go, all right? Now, the next thing is passions, okay? Passion. So the passions might be your pickleball team. I don't know why it's called pickle. It has nothing to do with pickleballs. Pickles, the balls aren't made out of pickles, and I don't know why it's called pickle. I don't know. But anyway, so maybe there's a passion that you have, and there are people that are in that passion with you that you do life with, all right? So you can see that's written in red, and I've split these up, all right? So I'm going to give you an example, and these names were serve uh, to protect the innocent so I don't really use real names. Okay, so here we go. Me, that's the first name. You see that in the middle, right? Okay, so from me, in my people, in my family, there's my cousin Seth and my uncle Bob. And they might be far from God. And God's put me in their life to be their ambassador to the gospel. Now, if Bob and Seth become followers of Jesus, now Bob has a chance to Lead his, be an ambassador to his wife, Amy. And then Seth has, has a son named Brody. And Seth, when he becomes a follower of Christ, is now going to go to Brody. And he's going to be an ambassador to Brody. All right? Now let's go to my place. I, I have co-workers, and their names are Jimmy and Max. And Jimmy, you know, he has two, he has a son named John and a wife named April. And Jimmy now... When I, when I am 
intentional, being an ambassador for God to him. Now he has an opportunity to respond to the truth of the gospel. And if he responds to the truth of the gospel, then he's going to affect other people, right? Same with Max. Max has got, um, he's got his, a daughter, Jen, and his son, Carson. And so he's going to impact them with his life as it changes for Christ. He's going to be their ambassador. Now, you see, we go to the passions. I have Jake and David. They're on my pickleball team. And, you know, they're really good, and they have a lot of friends in the pickleball community. Now, notice that I, I'm going out to a pickleball community because, you know, a lot of times what happens is we go, hey, I'm interested in pickleball. Hey, church, you know what you should do? You should start a pickleball league so we can have pickleball with all our church friends. But no, you know, I said, let's go out. I'm going to join a pickleball league in my neighborhood, and I'm going to meet people like David and Jake who are far from God. And I'm going to get to know them through playing a, a fun Dangerous sport. Okay? And, and Jake's connected to uh, Blake and Jack, and they, they used to be on his old team, and, you know, they're really, fun, they're really close friends, and they go hang out all the time. And then you got David there, and David's connected to Jeff. You see how this map shows us how our impact can be just by intentionally being ambassadors to the people in our life. Now, you have homework today. I know you weren't expecting that, but I all want you to go do some homework, okay? So I want you to go home, maybe this week, and I want you to draw your own Oikos map. I want you to take this and get very practical and get very real and say, God, who have you put in my life? Who am I to be an ambassador to? I want you to prayerfully consider this. Now, you can go to YouTube and and YouTube Oikos map, and they do a much better job of, of talking through it than I just did in this short period of time. So I encourage you, not right now if you're online, don't go right there right now, stay here. But, you know, go in, in, and research this a little bit. Figure out how you can use this in your life. And be intentional about how you are going to be an ambassador for God. Not just somebody that delegates it to somebody else. But, God, how are you going to use me and my, with my people, my place, and my passion? See, ambassadors, we know that we're made for more. We know that God has called us to a big calling. So we're going to drill down even deeper. So not only are we called to be saved by Christ, not only are we called to be ambassadors to the truth of the gospel, but God has another directive to us, and we pick that up in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. This is what that said, this verse says. Paul speaking to Timothy. And you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, Paul is getting ready to leave Ephesus, and he is, is, is giving the charge to Timothy, who is going to take on this ministry in Paul's absence. And so Paul had been investing in Timothy, had a very one-on-one, -on -one, close relationship, a lot of in influence in Timothy's life, and he, he, he trusts Timothy and he says, Timothy, to be successful, to be what God has called us to be, this is the model you have to follow. See, this verse is, is referred to sometimes as the multiplication verse, as the multiplication concept. And so Paul gives Timothy this charge. And there's a couple of things I want to point out here before we get to the directive. Okay, First off, he says this. He says, and what, you, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. What do you think Timothy heard Paul teach? Starts with a G. Gospel, you got it. Yeah, you're on it. You're good. The gospel. God has given Paul the exhortation to preach the gospel as his missionary, who then he trained Timothy. And in front of Timothy, 
preach the gospel, right? That's what Timothy had heard from Paul in the presence of many people. And he's telling Timothy, hey, you take that message of the gospel and you preach and you teach it. Continue to do that publicly. Now, there's another key word that I have just recently understood myself. And it says this, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. This is a little fun fact. He says many witnesses. He brings that up intentionally. Why? Because if those witnesses heard Timothy preaching a gospel that was different than the gospel Paul preached, what do you think would happen? They should, would call him out. Like, hey, that's not the right gospel. We heard something different from Paul. And that was going on a lot in the New Testament world. Paul addresses that many times in his letters. So Timothy is preaching the same gospel that Paul received from Christ. And now Timothy is being charged to preach the same gospel. But then he uses this very unique word here. He says, in the presence of many witnesses, entrusted or entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach also. Entrust. Now this, this word entrust is intentional and special. I don't want you to blow past it. Sometimes we just blow past words in Scripture. We don't know what they mean. And so this word entrust means to deposit. It can also mean to deposit. It's the same word family, okay, to make it a deposit. So not, what, not only was ta- Paul telling Timothy to publicly teach the gospel, but he wanted Timothy to personally deposit the gospel and train men to teach the gospel personally, one-on-one, individually, connected, together. It's a big word to entrust. Now, I have a son. He's 17 years old. And he's been driving for a little bit of a year. And he's a pretty good driver. You know, I'll give him some credit. You know, he's pretty good. He's a, he thinks he's a little better than he is, but he's pretty good. Now, my son, you know, we live just around the corner in Flowery Branch. And um, for those online, that's a long ways from here. Not, that, not long. It's a little ways. But to get here from Flowery Branch, he has to get on Interstate 85. Okay? It's a busy highway. And some of you are looking at me cross-eyed like, I can't believe you let your son drive on 85. You're crazy. So, entrusted is a special word. So, Jeff and Lauren have a newborn baby named Lively. She's, she's beautiful if you haven't seen her. Now, what if Jeff entrusted John David to drive li- Lively to Flowery Branch? What do you guys think? Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, y'all are like, what? No, please don't let that happen. It's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. But in trust, right? That would take a lot of trust and faith in John David for lively, right? This is precious. The gospel is precious. The most precious thing in all the world. And God has entrusted you and I to be ambassadors of it. And then Paul now is telling Timothy to entrust faithful men who can teach this gospel. You see, that's such, I want you to understand the gravity of that. Now, I was digging into this passage, and I came across one of the commentators who used this illustration. He did a great job with this illustration. And he, he, he talked about the word teach. Because a lot of us use that word as an escape clause. Teach. I, I'm not a teacher. Whew. I'm off the hook. I'm not a teacher. That, you know, Paul said, Timothy, get faithful men who are able to teach. So that, that disqualifies me. Good. I'm off the hook. Well, this word teach can mean about three different types of teaching. Okay? And I'm going to use this analogy that I found in the commentary. And it used the analogy of golf. Any golfers in the house? Yeah. Now, golf, it's important that you have clubs, right? And there are certain clubs that do certain things. 
Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a good golfer, but I like to play. But the reason I'm not a good golfer, that you should be thankful. That means I'm a better pastor. <laughs> so to play golf, you have a driver, right? Does everybody know what a driver is? This is a big stick, you know, that people get out and they try to hit really, really far, but they usually mess it up and it goes left or right, right? That's, that's the driver, okay? And it's meant to go cover long distances. It's meant to cover lots of ground. That's its purpose. It's, it's intended purpose for most of us that can't hit it. But anyway, so that's, that's like public speaking, covering a lot of ground, covering a lot of audience, a, big, a bigger audience, okay? That's one way of teaching. And, and, and definitely, Timothy needed to get those type of people to come alongside of him, correct? To help get this gospel, but then there's another type of club. It's called an iron. Now, an iron is a little bit more accurate. It's, le- it's not as long. It's a little shorter. And it helps you get from the fairway to the green where the hole is, okay? And so it's a little bit more accurate club. It's a, a little easier to hit. And so in that teaching analogy, you might equate that to our small groups or our life groups that we have on campus. And there are people in our congregation that God has called them and specifically gifted them to teach in that context, to groups, okay? And groups is how we grow, and we love our groups here. And that's important. But then there's another very important club we haven't talked about, and that's the putter. See, there's a saying in golf that you drive for show and you putt for dough. What that means is you can be all fancy and hit it very, very far, but unless you can get it from the green, the little green to the cup, it doesn't matter. And so the putter is important. It's very instrumental. It's, it's, it's easy to handle. It's tight, intimate, and close. And so this teaching would represent someone having close relationship, a small group of people that they're pouring their life into. Maybe you're not a, a, a public speaker, or maybe you're not a, a life group leader, but God's given you the gospel and you know enough of Scripture, and you've walked with God, you've been a tour guide, you know how God's taken you through the valleys and the mountains, and you have a little understanding of how God works in your life. And all God is asking you to do, Paul is asking Timothy to do, is entrust that to men to teach others. That we all have the responsibility to teach others. We're all putters. We all have intimate relationships with people. And maybe you don't have all the answers, but you know enough of who God is to tell somebody else how to follow him and what he's done for you and how you can help them read scripture and pray together. We all have this responsibility. And this is Timothy's being charged by Paul to get these types of people to help spread the gospel. Now think about this for a minute. We are sitting in this room And April, first Sunday in April of 2022, now think about this. What if Timothy had taken Paul's instruction, looked at Paul and said, Paul, I got it. I'm with you. But never entrusted the word to faithful men who were able to teach we might not be sitting here today. And the reason I say it like that is because you, as I said before, play such an important role in the gospel of Jesus to our world, to your oikos, to your people around you, to your sphere of influence. I want you to understand how important that is and that the joy and the beauty of us being able to participate in the gospel. Now, I have a little, another little illustration I want to show you. Turn your attention to the screen. Another practical illustration for all you visual learners today. Let's just say I was on fire for God, or you were on fire for God, and you're an evangelist. You love sharing the gospel. You're really good at it. Nothing intimidates you. And you're going to win a 1,000 people to Christ in a year. And you go do that, and you hit the pavement, and you're running after uh, sharing the gospel. 
as many people as you come in contact with. There's not a Starbucks around town that you haven't hit up, right? And you win a thousand people to Christ. That's, that's incredible. That's amazing. And then you do that not just one year, but you do it two years, three years, four years, five years, all the way up to 30 years. Sounds exhausting. But at the end of the 30 years, how many people are, are saved and have a relationship with Jesus? It's up there on the screen, a little cheat sheet. 30,000. That's right, 30,000 people. That's incredible. That's, that's amazing. Now, let's, that's called addition. Let's go to the other side of the, the chart here. We have multiplication. Year one, I invest in somebody that's in my sphere of influence. They come to know Christ. Then I pour my life into them. I'm one of those entrusted, faithful men that just teach the gospel, that just teach them how to walk and live for Christ in one year. After one year, I have, now we have what? Not a thousand, but how many? Two. The next year, I do that. And they invest in the other people, right? Those two I invested in, now they go get their own two, right? And year three, those people that they invest in, they go get their own two. And it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on. At the end of 30 years, we'd have over a, a billion, with a B, people who not are just someone that heard the gospel and, and maybe said a prayer, but have been walked with and taught how to follow and live for Jesus. Now, I know some of you mathematicians are just doing this in your head, and you're A-types, and you're like, well, I guess we only need seven people to get saved then. Seven billion people in the world for those that missed that. But we know that that's not going to, that don't always happen that way, right? We know not everybody's going to multiply and do the responsibility they've given. The illustration, of course, breaks down at some point, but the point is that if we invest in others, you see the impact it can have. While it might not be as many as the one, two, and three, four, five, six years initially, eventually it grows beyond what we could ever imagine our impact being. And our life will leave a legacy, not a dynasty. Sometimes we're, we're too busy trying to build our life for passing on wealth to our families. But wealth all we does is burn. Burns up, the scripture says. But a legacy outlives us. And faithful men, women, women and men who have been trusted with the gospel to teach other faithful women and men. Our mission statement says, live for God, exist for others. Some of you might have seen that on a t-shirt somewhere. Live for God, exist for others. And my challenge for you today is to follow 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And figure out who are your others. Who God is calling you to be an ambassador to. Who God is challenging you to be the gospel to. Who God has challenged you to teach others. And lead them to live a life that honors God. That joins in on the mission. That reconciles people to God. To become ambassadors for Christ to be faithful men. So here's the invitation today. You're saved for more. Much more than just attending church every Sunday. You're saved for more. Some of you might have heard in, online or in the room, you might have heard for the first time that I can be made new. All my sin can be reconciled with God because of Christ. You may have heard that for the first time today or understood that for the first time today. So my first invitation is, if that's you, we're gonna have some guys standing at the, at the aisles here and it would be their pleasure to tell you how to become a follower of Christ. It would be no more, they would have no more joy than anything in the world than to do that, than tell you that. 
So if that's you, please respond. Don't wait. Now for the rest of us that are saved, have been made new, have become ambassadors and been entrusted with the gospel, my, here's how I want you to respond. Kyle's going to lead us in a, a song of worship, a song of response. And I would like for you to take that time to pray. Ask God to place on your heart who you specifically are being called to. I want you to get faces and names in your head. And then I want you to pray right now for that person, that God would give you a moment to be an ambassador of the gospel in their life. So that's the invitation today. You can do that at your seat. You can use the stairs or the front of the stage, however you want to do it. But I just ask as believers that you intentionally pray and wait on the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Father, you're so good to us. You've invited us in to this process and responsibility to take your eternal saving grace to the dying and lost world. And so many times we've taken that and just kept it to ourselves and we've let distractions come in and put, our, put that fire and faith away. And we pour our attention into so many things that don't have any meaning at all. And so Lord God, I pray that we will be a church of conviction, a church that seeks out not only to just share the gospel, but help people live the gospel. Lord, I pray that as we lead today, we'll be different and changed and we'll see the people that you've placed in our life differently. For the one that needs to know you as Savior today, I pray that you give them boldness to step out. Pray that the enemy will not have victory today in that, in their hearts, and that they, for, for the first time, will go from their old sinful self to a brand new life in you. Thank you, Jesus, for our time to study your word. Help us respond. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.